What was the Silk Road and its economics? Let's talk about it. The Silk Road is named after the lucrative international trade in Chinese silk textiles that started during the Han Dynasty. Using one single name for this intricate web of trade routes is a modern invention. The name Silk Road was coined by the geographer Ferdinand von Richtenfen in the late 19th century. Being a German native, he used the names Seidenstraub and Seidenstrauben, which translates to Silk Road and Silk Roads. Unsurprisingly, use of the term Silk Road is not uncontroversial. The Silk Road was a network of trade routes connecting the East and the West in ancient and medieval times. The term is used for both overland routes and those that are marine or limnic. The Silk Road involved three continents, Europe, Africa, and Asia. In addition to silk, a wide range of other goods was traded along the Silk Road, and the network was also important for migrants and travelers and for the spread of religion, philosophy, science, technology, and artistic ideals. The Silk Road had a significant impact on the lands through which the routes passed, and the trades played a significant role in the development of towns and cities along the Silk Road routes. Many merchants along the Silk Road were involved in relay trade, where an item would change owners many times and travel a little bit with each one of them before reaching its final buyer. It seems to have been highly unusual for any individual merchants to travel all the way between China and Europe or Northern Africa. Instead, various merchants specialized in transporting goods through various sections of the Silk Road. Some of the items were silk textiles, lacquerware and porcelain from China, sandalwood from India, saffron, pistachio nuts and dates from Persia, myrrh and frankincense from Somalia, and glass bottles from Egypt. The Silk Road consists of several routes. Among the overland routes, the dominating ones were the Northern Route, the Southern Route, and the Southwestern Route. So let's talk about the Northern Route. The easternmost point of the Northern Route was Chang'an, an important city in central China. Chang'an was the capital of more than 10 different Chinese dynasties. The Northern Route became popular around the 1st century BC when the Chinese Emperor Wu of Han, who reigned from 141 to 87 BC, used his army to keep nomadic tribes from attacking travelers within his sphere of influence. The Southern Route went from China through the Karakoram Mountains. Because of this, it was also known as the Karakoram Route. The Karakoram Mountain Range spans the borders of Pakistan, India, and China, and also extends to Afghanistan in the Northwest. West of the Karakara Mountains, the southern route had many spurs heading south to the sea, since many travelers wished to continue by ship instead of going overland. For those who did not head south to the ocean, the southern route continued over the Hindu Kush Mountains and into Afghanistan, joining the northern routes before reaching Merv in Turkmenistan. From Merv, the southern route went westward in almost a straight line through northern Iran, Mesopotamia, and the northern outskirts of the Syrian desert, to reach Levant where ships were waiting to take the precious cargo across the Mediterranean to southern Europe. Continued travel over land was also possible from the Levant, either north through Anatolia or south to northern Africa. There was also a branch of the Silk Road that went from Herat in Afghanistan to the ancient port of Karax Kazuga by the Persian Gulf, passing through Susa on the way. The journey continued by ship to various Mediterranean ports such as Petra. And then there is the southwestern route. This went from China to India through the Ganges Delta. This delta region was an important trading hub and archaeological excavations have found an astonishing array of goods from various parts of the world here, such as ancient Roman beads and gemstones from Thailand and Java. And then there is trading hubs. The region's role as a trading hub also meant that the area served as a currency exchange. Most Western currencies never made it further east than this, and most Eastern and Chinese coins never made it further west than that. The traders in the Ganges Delta primarily used Eastern currencies when they traded with Eastern merchants, and Western currencies when they traded with Western merchants. Traders would exchange currency with each other to have the appropriate currency when trading and merchants from different regions. This was not strictly speaking necessary since the coins were made out of precious metals and their worth was determined by their gold or silver value. Many traders would nonetheless prefer to trade using currencies that was widely circulated in their part of the world. For example, Western traders preferred the silver drachma of the Neo-Persians or the gold celadus of the Byzantine Empire, and Eastern traders preferred Chinese currency. This then introduced currency brokers. The traders in the Ganges Delta filled the function similar to what currency traders do today. Currency brokers help facilitate the trade between different countries and cultures by allowing people to buy and sell currencies. Today, these brokers also facilitate currency speculation and foreign exchange trading. Today, the buying and selling of currencies to make a profit are based on the exchange rate. This was not possible at the time of the Silk Road, since the value of currencies were fixed to the value of the metals they were made of. So what are your thoughts? Do you think China's new Silk Road will be as impactful as the original? If you like this video, hit that like button and consider subscribing. I talk about money and everything related to it, so don't miss out. 
And as always, take care of your money.